and the UK. Well, thank you for uh, joining me, joining us for our weekly time of exploring nature-centered folklore, connecting this to within your favorite sanctuary space, and expressing inspired visions from your sanctuary, whether it's through your poetry, your writing, art, craft, performance, and even your problem solving. Now, today's Sunday session is the second of our tree theme sessions that we got through March. And uh, today is Tree Sanctuary and Labyrinth Garden creation. And I'm um, sorry, we're not outside today because of the weather like we have been. It would have been lovely to have done this uh, particular addition out in the center of the tree labyrinth, but this is what we're served with today. Uh, but this is about access to an essential space to enjoy nature and even the connection to the great spirit or whatever you call it. So this is a Sunday session about uncomplicated and easy tree and nature connection. Now, this is something that most of us should be able to do. Uh, uh, I'm having, uh, <laughs> I've been having hiccups, I can't get rid of that picture. Uh, there we go. We'll get there in a moment. Uh, well, I'm frozen again. There we go. And Sorry, I'll, I'll get out of this loop in a moment. Uh, I've been having computer problems. Okay, there you go. You can see me again. Now, the guests today, they include, well, they're, we'll bring them back up again. Bea Salmon Hawk. Uh, Bea, the storyteller, she's a lovely guest that we've had on some of these sessions before. And if she'll come up, oh, goodness, I'm really uh, jinxed. Here we go. Come on up. There you go. Uh, there's Bea herself. And, um, we share Bayer planting some trees and telling a story about that. We did, we're going to have a last week, but it didn't get her on, unfortunately. And uh, we've got uh, Anderson Ledger, a man in Ireland for inspiring and lobbying uh, for better native woodland policies in Ireland. And, and uh, I'll be talking with the wonderful lady that uh, he's with there, if she would stay there for a second, uh, which is lovely. And I expect Andrew will share the Woodland League Forest in a Box project. And I was talking a bit about this last week, and some of you were very interested, and there we go, the Forest in a Box. And it intrigued some of you when I talked about this last week. And uh, Andrew is a very wide, very knowledgeable, sensitive forester who will probably share some tips for creating your own uh, tree sanctuary, or anything you do with the community with your native forest, along with some very important reasons for doing this. Uh, so uh, we'll finish off with a song uh, from Howard Hawksley. We haven't had him on for a while. Uh, and uh, to remind you about Howard, there he is there, where he should be here. And I'm sorry about this being sticky today. Uh, there he is. Um, uh, so today's topics are going to include the purpose for having a tree sanctuary. Uh, there you go, a, a gate for a tree sanctuary. Labyrinth Gardens alternatives. Um, and I know some of you that are watching, you do have Labyrinth Gardens, which is lovely. Community, and then community project potential for a sanctuary, whether it's a tree sanctuary or a garden sanctuary. Uh, there's a lovely one there. We'll be talking about what that is and getting started even with your own little uh, tree nursery, maybe. So uh, that's uh, there's a tree nursery one picture coming up. Uh, so planting a tree sanctuary, maybe, uh, maybe you feel like uh, if you a lot of people watching us are permaculture people. And uh, permaculture people like to have a bit of a sanctuary woodland as well. And then we'll have a panel session at the end for your questions and answers. Anyway, let's see how you're doing with the comments. As I say, apologies for the pictures being a bit sticky today. I hope you're seeing us fine. Let's say hello to who's on board. Uh, there's Donna, good morning. Uh, Donna, you managed to get here this time, fantastic. 
uh, we're about the right time. Well done. Because there's been the uh, time change in the USA. So I was saying to USA people, you get an hour lay in, but of course you don't. You're still sleeping the same amount of time. But uh, it's just a clock if you've had it changed, says another hour. And another USA lovely person, Davina's here. Uh, thank you for being here. Donna's here. And uh, with the stickiness, I hope you're seeing and hearing this because I know the signal has been up and down. Uh, it's been a sort of a uh, tech nightmare for the last hour. So it's lovely uh, that you're with us. And um, so let's get on with the uh, show here. Thank you for being with us, uh, the, the early birds here. Now, the purpose of uh, Tree Sanctuary to me is... Uh, well, first, let's say I warmly applaud the people of who have taken over some stewardship of land. As a lot of people you know in the USA and some of the people watching um, us today, they've already done this. And this is happening in Ireland. People have taken over tracts of farmland and they're converting into yeah. native woodland. And I certainly warm warmly applaud people who do this and dedicated to the purpose of expanding with uh, woodland cover and I'm going to talk a lot more about this next Sunday with the Ushin Trees session, which, um, although I'm sure Andrew will be, shortly will be able to talk a bit about this as well. But for this Sunday session, we're going to mainly uh, focus on small tree projects that most of us can do in some way if we uh, put our passion and mind to it. And uh, there's a small tree project. <laughs> that, that one's in Limerick. And... Uh, but uh, by having this, uh, it's a way to provide us with a calming and inspiring sanctuary that's really priceless. And it really is doing a bit uh, for the ecosystem around us as well as for our own therapy and good feeling. So uh, this is also a session for people who might not have the space for trees or somehow challenged by trees. There's various reasons. So that's why we're going to cover a bit of labyrinth garden creation, maybe with herbs, flowers, soft fruit plants that um, you may have available. And I believe that I would be really lost, though, if I didn't have the tree labyrinth garden that we got here at Karakoria. That's one of the part in the path of it. But once it is established, once you've established your tree sanctuary or a tree labyrinth garden, the lovely thing about it is it tends to take a life of its own. And the maintenance is far less than you may have with other gardens, like with flowers, uh, fruit and vegetables and herbs. So soon we'll have access to outside space that opens us to more time to bathe in sanctuary. And that's what happens if you do a tree one. It gives you more time to actually be with it rather than trying to care for it. Now, I feel there's uh, two main purposes and benefits from at least having a small tree sanctuary. Uh, the first I find is um, a place for retreat. And I, I'm really sort of repeating this, a place definitely for retreat, re rest, connect with the outdoor surroundings. Um, and it's something you can do really whatever the weather. I couldn't take the equipment out now, but somewhere to contemplate. I couldn't resist putting that one back out. That's the middle of the tree sanctuary. But uh, definitely bathe in it. And uh, the second is a place to be very accepting to your inspirations, your ideas, your visions. Clarity is, I say, uh, problem solving. And these are things that uh, I start the Sunday sessions off with. Uh, and I talk about those two purposes anyway. Now, what we do, of course, here is offer nature-based folklore as one source of inspiration for doing all this. And I trust through these Karakori Sunday sessions, something will inspire and encourage you to create and maintain an existing uh, tree sanctuary or, if you can't, a labyrinth garden. You can draw together local people and uh, share at least a labyrinth garden idea. Uh, if you can put trees together, absolutely wonderful. Uh, here's some people that did some sharing in the neighborhood uh, there. Uh, but let's see what you're actually saying about this at the moment before we go on to our first 
absolutely wonderful guest. Uh, Big Bear, you're back uh, from the YouTube. On the meet up. Uh, lovely to be here. Uh, Davina saying hello again. Good morning from Canada from Maria. Uh, there we go. Sherry is with us. Uh, it's nearly all USA today, isn't it? Uh, I suppose because you haven't got the Mother's Day. It's not your Mother's Day. But from Dublin, there we go. We got Claire Roach on board, which is fabulous. So hello, Claire. Lovely to see you uh, there. And Donna reminding us that she's from New Mexico. Uh, so uh, some of the regulars. Oh, but, uh, Big Bear, you're, you're Ireland as well. I forgot. Uh, uh, saying hello. Uh, forgive me for missing out on that because you've become quite a regular. So thank you so much. Now, let's go straight on to our first guest. Um, and uh, this is something uh, very excited about, uh, Anderson Ledger, uh, an amazing man. Excuse me, I'm a uh, very special guest for Sunday sessions, so excuse me for sort of a longer introduction than I usually give. Now, Andrew uh, here, uh, his, here he is. Uh, he's dedicated his life to his passion for encouraging people in Ireland to become forest people again. That's, uh, that's the way I sort of describe it. And he was a founder of the Woodland League with the amazing forester Ted Cook. We brought Ted Cook up before, and there he is. And Andrew has uh, created his own wonderful native woodland uh, due to his calling. And the result of his woodland and his native woodland and, and the whole uh, connection uh, to nature around him has resulted in being an example of how woodland should be and how nature has is controlled by minimum human control. Now, Andrew, when he can, he does uh, facilitate interactive workshops as part of the Green Schools program, and uh, he serves similar with adults too. And as well as creating encouragement in native woodland expansion and care, wherever he's got an opportunity to do so. And Andrew also shares his extended knowledge of Irish tree law, OM, and the essential Breton laws, things we talk about on the Sunday session that uh, form the relationship of humans and their forests uh, and the wildlife within it. And through the platforms of the Woodland League and its alliance with the larger environmental pillar in Ireland, Andrew is an outstanding tireless campaigner and lobbyist for it's a much needed and seriously overdue forestry reform that's needed here in Ireland. So we're fortunate because Andrew actually knows the language and the lingo uh, that the people in power use. Uh, it's fascinating to read through it, but how much do they listen to that or read it? Well, I don't know. It might not be so good sometimes. Anyway, as you know, last week I presented an introduction to the Wooden League Forest in the Box program. Uh, just to remind you there, there's... There is a forest in the box, and we'll get a few words. And that's uh, even endorsed by our president. There you go. President Higgins endorses the Woodland Leagues Forest in a Box project. So there, that shows you how important it is. And though it's an Irish project, and you viewers mainly from the USA uh, and other countries, you'll be able to adapt it in some way. I hope this is helpful. Uh, so Andrew hopefully will tell you more about Forest in a Box plus share with you some wisdom of forest culture. And I trust all this will inspire a passion with you to increase your connection, your reconnection, and perhaps even become forest people again, because I'm always pushing that idea. So that, my friends, is a lot more than just planting a few native trees. It's the whole passion of it. So, but the planting is a non broad start. But to quote a uh, uh, Ted Cook uh, quote in Ireland, we are a forest people without a forest. I wish I could imitate him saying that. So for me, it's a huge, huge honor to have the extremely busy Andrews and Ledger spare some minutes with us here on Sunday sessions for a bit longer, I hope, than my introduction just now. So here he is. I'm going to uh, get my ears and introduce you to Andrew. And hello there. Sorry for taking so long, but uh, we're so pleased to have you here. And it's how you're doing there. <laughs> can you, is it all clear and can you hear me now? I can, yeah. Can you, can you hear me? Everything yeah. is clear and wonderful. I think we got a signal. So, as I say, one thing I'm eager, uh, we got interest and feedback last week. Forest in a box. Give us a 
a preview of that for, to start with. It'd be wonderful. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you for the opportunity. And uh, again, just to say, you know, happy Mother's Day to all, all of the mothers and to Mother Earth, um, and welcome, everybody. Um, the, the Forest in a Box, I suppose, is um, it, it's inspired by a German uh, forester uh, called Dunaman. Um, and he was looking at how trees, you know, were, were grown in um, nurseries, kind of commercial nurseries. And he started to question, you know, the methods that are the methods that are used. Um, basically, the trees, you know, are given a very sheltered kind of upbringing. And when they're, you know, ready to be taken out of a commercial nursery, they are put into, you could say, into the wild. It takes a long time for them to adjust. And he figured that they seemed to be weaker than trees that would naturally, you know, through natural regeneration, um, grow in the woodland. And he, I suppose, linked the, the health of the naturally regenerated tree to the fact that it's growing in a, a woodland uh, leaf, leaf mulch. And if the woodland is healthy, that leaf mulch has a uh, an active relationship with uh, mycelium uh, and that it's the mycelium is giving the young tree an immune system kind of boost and it's also acting as it you know as, as we know as a distribution connectivity system within the woodland uh, it's a communication network it's a distribution system of water minerals nutrients medicine for sick trees for sick plants and he, he looked at the idea of growing you know seed um using leaf, leaf mulch and that's where the inspiration came for the forest in a box uh, a good friend of ted cook's um tony adams who lives in west cork another great uh, tree person uh, tony was the person i suppose who experimented with dunaman beds making a uh, long dunaman beds and, and growing uh, mainly hazel and oak uh, th those seeds were the most suited to the the leaf mulch um there's also a layer of um, native pine the scots pine some pine needles are mixed in with the woodland uh, leaf, broadleaf uh, mulch and the the pine needles is to give a little bit of acidity to the mix and uh, just help break down the, the hard shell of the seeds. Um, uh, the other thing I should say is the leaf mulch can be collected from the woodland, but we wouldn't be encouraging people to take woodland soil out of its proper place. Um, if you, you know, if you're taking a small amount, that that's fine. But it's the, you scrape off the top the top layer and you go after the the leaf mulch probably from two years ago three years ago where it's actually breaking down so it's composting and that's the the most valuable leaf mulch for the, for growing it's a growing medium um so with our project with the bot i you know was looking for a, a means of answering Diana Beresford Kruger, who is a consultant scientist to the Woodland League. And, you know, her, her amazing film, Call of the Forest, I was looking for a way to answer the call of the forest, you know, in a practical way, but also in a way that was going to try and inspire and connect uh, the children who will be the decision makers of the future and also whose future is in our hands at this um, critical time in the Earth's history. And I came up with the idea of making a miniature version of, a, of the Dunaman bed and, uh, you know, making it in such a way that it's a one square meter box that 
you know, any school, even in an inner city, in an, you know, an area, deprived area of an inner city, that they could find a space, at, at least they could find one square meter if they didn't have a garden, if they didn't have access to land, that they could at least find, you know, one, one square meter. And in that sense, um, that, that's where it was born. The box copies the, the again, going back to Dunaman, the idea of the sides of the box, it recreates a hole in the forest floor, which is how a tree naturally will grow in a woodland. And the box, so the sides of the box, which are about 18 to 20 inches high, um, create a kind of, um, they block the light so that the light coming into the box is mainly from the top. The uh, Bottom of the box has uh, chicken wire, a, a, a kind of wire mesh. The top, the lid also has uh, chicken wire mesh. And that's again going back to Dunaman, basically protecting the seeds in the, it's an incubator system for native trees. And in nature, most of the seed, you know, an oak tree will put out thousands of seeds but very few of those will survive. So what the box does is it increases the chances of the survival of the seed. And it's probably gone from a less than 1% chance of survival to 99% by keeping out the, the mice, the voles, the rodents, and also blocking birds. That's the purpose of the lid. Until the trees start to develop, then you can you take the lid off and one box is capable of growing between 150 to 200 trees, which can grow to, you know, almost two foot high in, in one year. It's pretty amazing. The first time I saw it, I was astonished. So another, I suppose, an, another aspect of the box is it's connecting children with, rather than giving children trees to plant, we're giving them seeds to plant. So they're connecting in with that, um, the seed energy. Um, the word entelechi is a Greek Greek word. And it, entelechi means the potential within an acorn to become a 1,000 year old, you know, huge oak tree, 60 meter high oak tree um, with all of the benefits that we know. And when, you know, when the children are handling the acorns, I remind them that what they're holding is something that can become 1,000 years old, can become a host to the, the latest figures and research on oak from the UK Woodland Trust show 2,300 species are associated with oak, which really, you know, puts it at the forefront in terms of European uh, habitat or plant kingdom as the climax vegetation of Europe. You know, and 268 of those species are ob obligate species. And that means they're only associated with an oak tree. Uh, 284 of those species are insects that include the, the gall wasp, which is only associated with oak and for which the oak tree creates the oak apple, which, grow, you know, incubates the egg of the gall wasp and provides food and shelter. Until that wasp is ready, it drills a hole. And that, you know, those oak apples were used to make uh, indelible black ink. They were crushed in a bowl with uh, iron filings and the tannins in the the chemicals from the oak tree that are in the oak apple would react with the iron and water and give you indelible black ink. So the ink in the, the black ink in the Book of Kells is made from oak apples. Um, so just, you know, coming back to helping children connect with that magic of the seed and then for them to be inspired by seeing their seed growing in a box with other, you know, hazel and oak. Um, and the idea being that 
they'd be encouraged then to plant those trees this you know after the first year they need to be uh, they're all kind of stem they're all teenager they need uh, their roots developed so the second year is about developing the roots or in, you know um that could be by potting on or putting into tren trenching into the ground um it's yeah it's a method can be applied in other countries you know that those type of uh, nut type seeds will grow in the box but all the, all of the seeds will grow all of the native species would grow but the 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 harder seeds would probably take one or two seasons before they would soften up um like the yewberry the hawthorn uh, the holly so that that's where it that's where the box is. It's about inspiring children to connect. Like we, we've also developed a Know Your Native Trees uh, whiteboard presentation. So that gives that gives the children the context of why our native trees are so so important. We get we just touch on a little bit of the mythology, the history, the ohm, the tree laws, and try and encourage uh, pride in the children. Of the fact that Ireland, who, whose earliest name was Inish Navioha, Island of the Sacred Trees, uh, that our Ireland has a unique and ancient forest culture that can help inspire the world in its reforestation or restoration, um, plant, uh, you know, that that's badly needed. So, th so that's where that, that's where it's at. Um, the in it like that, uh, that name of Ireland, as I say, the island of the sacred trees, um, it also re relates to one of the earliest um, uh, legends of Ireland about the five divisions. Ireland was divided into five divisions, and the five divisions were marked each by a sacred tree. And the sacred tree in Ireland is called Billa, B I L E, a Billa. And what what um, the legend goes that the a person appeared at Tara. Tara would have been the main kind of centre for the high kings of Ireland, Tara in County Mead. And uh, on some particular day, when there was uh, trouble in the land, a person called uh, Tre Tre Good Tre Ochre which kind of sounds Welsh almost, a very interesting name. He appeared to the assembly at Tara holding a magic branch. And on that branch were apples, acorns, hazelnuts, yew berries, all on the same, on the same branch. And also ash keys, I think the seeds of the ash tree. And he instructed uh, Fintan, who was the son of Bokra. Fintan, a young boy, was instructed to take the seeds and plant them in special places, in five places. And from those seeds came the five sacred trees of Ireland. And um, in a way, that's also inspired the forest in a box in regard to encouraging the young the the youth the young people the children to take the seeds grow grow their trees and create sacred trees and sacred groves in their community you know hopefully in time community woodlands can be inspired that's one of the objectives or small groves as, as john is encouraging you know you don't need a back garden you can grow just a couple of trees even you know you don't need a huge amount of space um but the the five sacred trees of Ireland had names. They were the 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 Crave Dahi, which is David's branch, which is a kind of biblical reference. Um, there was the Yo the Yo Muna, and Yo is connected to the yew tree in ancient art, but it can also be an oak. So that that was grown in Moon, where today you have a Moon Abbey in Carlow. Um, the 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 Yo sorry the Yo Moon. Uh, there was the the Billa Tortain. The Billa Tortain was in uh, Ard Bracken, which is 
in County Mead, near uh, near to Tara. Um, there was the the Yo Rossa, which is in Leyland Bridge, again I think in Carlow. And there was one more billa. There was the billa Ishnok, which was a, uh, as we know, the, the fifth province of Ireland. The very centre of Ireland is Ishnok. Ishnok was a sacred ceremonial centre, covering a large, like it was like, I suppose, a comparison might be the Vatican City in Rome. That the Ishnok was like a self-sustaining, uh, almost complex complex of sacred sites where the the brehan laws the laws of the land the ancient brehan laws were the glue that held the irish gaelic society together and were the glue that ensured that the society was stable you know we have a, a 1000 year period a golden period of learning of wisdom of medicine of of science of astrology a time when Europe was in the Dark Ages. Ireland has a golden age. And one of the reasons is because it has a st stable law system that the people love. Unusually, the people actually love the law um, because it's based on natural law and it's about justice and balance and fairness. It's not about punishment. It's not about giving one person advantage over another. It's there to ensure that society seven generations into the future has stability. Within those laws, you have protection for the, for the forest because the understanding then with all indigenous peoples of the world is the forest is our life support system for this planet. The forest is the manager of our climate. The forests, natural forests, manage the water, they manage the air, they they manage, they create soil, they do so, you know, to create habitat, they create materials for building, they create food, they create, you know, fire. So so much of our civilization would not have well none we wouldn't have a civilization without our interaction with our oldest friends, the forest and the trees. And that understanding was broken. You know, it was known by indigenous people. So the Brehan laws respected and reflected what was, you know, widely known uh, among indigenous people. So over 2000 years ago, the Brehan laws are in use and they are, as I say, protecting trees. There, there was more protection for trees 2000 years ago in Ireland than there is today. Um, the section of the law relating to the tree list the lists of trees is called breha komai kesa and breha komai kesa means the laws of neighborhood so the laws of neighborhood give a list of all of the say everything a, a person can take from the woods without taking too much so the night's kindling the the wood for a butter churn the wood for a staff or a spear, the wood to make a stretcher. It's all listed, what you can take. The nuts, the nut gathering of a wood. Um, it's there, it's laid out, but it's all about, again, the, sh the communal use, community uh, benefits, community use, or uses. Um, the trees are broken down into four groups of seven. Seven being a magical <laughs> kind of word, as John laughs. Um, yeah, but it, by coincidence, perhaps, if there is such a thing, Ireland's groups of trees are grouped into four groups of seven. We, Because Ireland separated from England before, you, you know, the, the landmass, when we were connected to Europe after the Ice Age, and as the ice melted, and the forest started to come back um, as the the ice the sea uh, seas rose. Well, Ireland broke away, so it didn't get the land bridge was kept intact between England and Europe. So more species managed to come across that land bridge to the UK than managed to make it here. Here we were we were limited with 21, 21 main tree species. 
And the fourth group of seven is made up of the bushes, the bushes of the wood. So the, this um, tree list of four groups of seven, in a way, <coughs> excuse me, it shows an, a deep understanding of ecology. It shows it, that they knew there was a relationship between the smallest plants and the, and the largest, oldest plants, that they were, they were basically, they formed a society. <coughs> and um, again, it's something the poet and artist John Ruskin, a quotation of his was that society would do well to look to the natural forest as to how it organizes itself. Because in the natural forest, <coughs> everybody has its place and there's cooperation, where in the man-made world, there's the opposite. We're fighting for each other's places. <coughs> there's competition, too much, uh, which leads to war. So the four groups of trees were the, the first group was the Arig, Arig Fado, which means the noble, the noble trees. And they were the, the oak, the ash, the yew, the hazel, the apple, the Scots pine, and uh, I'm missing one, John. <coughs> I think, am I? Willow. Holly. Willow. No, no, no. Ash, ash, yew, holly, ash, hazel, oh, yes. Scots yes. ash. Um, so these were considered the most valuable, and there were heavy penalties at the time associated with uh, will willfully damaging those trees. Now, you might ask, what, what is Hazel doing in, the, in this list? What is the <laughs> apple? Apple was the wild apple. <clears throat> uh, what are they, you know, they're small trees, the holly. These are not uh, canopy trees. However, within the Gaelic society, the Brehan laws understood, you know, the importance of the hazel for food production, the hazel nuts, and also for building the, the wattle, there's a wattle fence behind me here. The wattling was, had so many uses. It was the two by one of the day. So for all kinds of building and fencing, <coughs> excuse me, hazel rods were, were used. Uh, the apple, again, was food, but it was also medicine. It was used for digest, digestive problems and issues and probably other uses we've, again, lost uh, connection to. But it was considered very sacred. And also there was a, a color, a dye associated with the inside of the bark of the ap apple tree bark. Um, there was a dye which gives a yellow, a beautiful golden yellow color, if I'm not mistaken. And it's possibly one of the reasons why it was in that list. The holly was our, is our hardest hardwood. So holly was used for skewers, for meat skewers, for cooking pits where you need, you know, very hard wood that can withstand fire. Uh, a spit for cooking a pig would be made from holly. Uh, spears were made from holly, but also the, the shaft of a chariot was made from holly. Um, the, the yew was there basically that was the most sacred tree of Ireland. And the yew was, um, was used for the, the, the furniture for, for kings, for, for royalty. The utensils, the, the, the plates, the mugs, the, the mether, the, the, the four-sided cup, which was used for, again, sh sharing. There were four sides to it, probably for, for negotiating a deal with four parties or two parties or three parties. Anyway, the, the, yew, the wood of the yew was sacred. So there was a separate type of a carpenter called an Everoct. E the Everoct only worked with yew and would have been like a samurai maker in Japan. They would have been trained and would have been the son of an Everoct. And basically the skills were passed down that um, the, the ordinary carpenter worked with all of the other woods, with the ash, with the pine, you know, mostly. Um, but they weren't allowed to work with you. You needed uh, 
respect, reverence, and um, you know, training a, a lot of training and discipline. You is a very powerful energy, and you is the tree that is the gateway between this world and the, and the other world. It's why it's probably still in graveyards today. And it was uh, seen as a tree that could live forever. It had overcome death. So the resurrection story is within the you. The you was seen to never die, to come back from the dead. As the Fortingale you in Scotland appears to be six, 7,000 years old, and there are a number of young shoots coming up from all around it, a forest of you, all connected to the parent, so that it's it does look like it can live it can live on forever. Uh, wow. The other interesting, <clears throat> well, the other interesting link with life and death and the you is, as we know, the the poison from the you, which is from the bark, from the leaf, or taken from the seed of the you berry. That poison is the most active poison known to man. So if you ingest ingest that poison, you're you're dead within 10, 10 minutes. Um, hunter, hunter gatherers understood this and they dipped their arrows in that poison for hunting and I suppose for war. Now, now interestingly enough, that you know again the most deadly weapon in say Bron or Iron Age and right into medieval times was the U longbow, an unbelievable force, you know, was able to fire an arrow with severe force that has been tested and matched to almost the force of a gun. So that tells us the strength, the elasticity. Uh, the, the U longbows were actually trained by hanging weights off the ends of them, like the way you build up muscle in a gym. They're to to make give them more elasticity, more strength. So they were they were working with the memory of wood in that they, again, knew that by training the U into ridiculous kind of curves, that the, the wood would remember that shape and not break. So just again, linking it to the, the positive and the, the life aspect of the U is the fact that the... Um, the most one of the most effective medicines for cancer um, breast cancer in women being mother's day as interferon which is i think synthesized now but if it it was originally it comes from the the u it, it, um so it it can kill you or cure you it had that has that ability oh. and again if well, we look at um, <laughs> If you look Sorry. at Diana Beresford. Oh, carry Diana on. Beresford. Sorry. I, I... Diana's Beresford Kruger's, you know, promotion of the um, abilities of trees to uh, release aerosols, a range of different aerosols. Each species would have a toolbox of organic chemicals manufactured in each species completely, again, adapted to that tree. Um, and she explains that's why for, one of the main reasons forest bathing, um, it works on the principle that you're, you're bathing in these very beneficial aerosols, which help your immune system, help your nervous system, um, help us in so many ways. But we, you know, she also talks about the egg production in birds birds producing eggs, it's caused by tree aerosols, which change vitamin A in the bird to vitamin D, which triggers egg production. So no trees, no birds, no eggs. Which came first, the, the tree or the egg or the bird? Mm -hmm. I would say the tree, our oldest friends. So, um, sorry, John, you wanted to come in. Oh, I was, I was just... Um... As I say, I, uh, I, I, this should go on for a couple of hours, um, but uh, it's wonderful. You started off uh, wonderfully, and uh, what I really loved is, you know, starting off from the box, you, uh, the way that you talked about the responsibility uh, of the leaf mold, the responsibility with the forest floor, then how you went on to the, the mythology. Uh, I had a whole list of questions, which, and you've answered them all. <laughs> Maybe the people here have got a, a few more questions, but 
so much. Uh, thank you for uh, your generosity uh, with what you've shared. Uh, it's caught everything there. Uh, the sherry was thanking you very much for caring so much of the children and the trees. And uh, this is the whole thing uh, that you've been putting over, the whole passion, which is uh, what we're delighted with. And Ina, uh, if you're still here, she does, uh, she's very much into teaching this stuff uh, by Lock Gill County Sligo. And I'm sure she's really been thankful for what you've had to say. That's uh, fabulous. As far as Irish people getting hold of uh, the forest in the box, I kind of talked to them a little bit about this last week, uh, about the costing and about uh, the consultancy with this. So if you can give a little bit of an idea of how to get hold of a forest of a box uh, with your help. Um, yeah, I, I suppose the, the project began in about 2017 and when we launched the, um, or had the call of the forest, um, the, what do you call it, the, the premiere showing in Ireland, we, um, we would have launched the forest in a box as I say, that it, it answers the call of the forest. And since then, we've, we've been de developing the project. And we're, we're at, you know, we've probably about 32 boxes in seven different counties, mostly in schools, uh, one in a community kind of retreat center. Um, and what we've been relying on to to fund the project is uh, local agenda 21 funding um, with the count, county councils and um, what what we found is you know it's it's um, it's been a means for, to help us develop the project but the co the cost things go beyond what money is offered you know you you submit an application and you might get half of what you're looking for and we've been kind of subsidizing it ourselves. Um, but we are looking to um, scale the project up. And to that end, we're training up a couple more people to, del to deliver the project. We hope to have funding in place for 16 boxes in County Wicklow. And we have 16 schools uh, lined up. Um, <clears throat> so for the moment, as I say, we are looking at um, looking at trying to have build up the capacity to deliver the project to to scale it up. But we we are also looking at um, you know looking at the idea of putting it out there, which we always have done um, as a kind of DIY and putting all the you know everything up on a on a website. So. Again, to do that, it's time. It's trying to get funding to pay somebody who knows what they're doing, you know, to put up the Know Your Native Trees presentation so people could access it like a toolbox online. And what we'd love to do is, you know, develop a kind of site on our website where the schools can talk to each other, groups can talk to each other, they can share le shared learning and experiences around the boxes and then encourage, as I say, creation of community na native woodlands. So that, that's where it's at at the moment. Uh, I'll keep John posted in regard to how that evolves. So that, that's where it's at. And we've got uh, Joe Hansen was uh, saying she'd like to run a forest in a box project. Uh, what we'll do, Joe, uh, when the broadcast yeah, give us, is finished, give us your I'll give the Woodland League um, uh, details and I'll put them in the yes. comments. <clears throat> and also, that. if I might just say at this point, um, we, you know, we we are also um, running a campaign at the moment, which is to, uh, you know, conserve, restore, and expand our, our ancient woodlands, because the, our ancient woodlands, we've only point zero point two percent left. They're threatened. They're the most valuable land-based habitat we have. And they, these are fragments of temperate rainforest. Ireland's authentic landscape is Western Atlantic temperate rainforest. And as I say, these fragments are vulnerable. 
they're, they're little isolated islands. They're threatened with invasive species, with development, you know, with farming. And uh, you will find a, a petition we have on uh, at www.thewoodlandleagueforestinabox.ie. So there's more information about the Forest in a Box on that site. And we'd encourage people to share, sign the petition and share share it as well and try and build up um, a enough signal, you know, pressure to make sure that these ancient pockets of woodland can be expanded. We can't replant them. We can't recreate them. These are the, the same in any other parts of the world. The complex biodiversity that has evolved since the Ice Age can only be really allowed to expand and walk. We need to help create as Ted Cook says, create space for nature. So by you know encouraging landowners, farmers, whoever that are adjacent to these ancient sites, we would like to see them encouraged to allow the forest expand and give it space. Because our future seeds, our our future forests, are in the you know the seed energy is in those ancient places, as well as the all of the other magical energy of the forest, the Brehan Laws, it's in the soils beneath those trees. Well, thanks very much for all that, Andrew. It's a vast subject, and uh, I'm glad you've been able to squeeze everything into this little package. And uh, I've got to move on with a couple of other things. I would have loved to listen, uh, and hopefully we can have you as a guest again on some of these subjects. But uh, just thank you so much, and I'm sure people have been watching, and the people that will be watching the archives will be uh, absolutely delighted with it. So thanks again for that. And hang on, because we're going to come back to you with a bit of questions and answers in a few minutes. But thank you so much okay. for that. Thank you. We'll be back. All right. Oh, boy. <laughs> that was that was more than I expected. Absolutely brilliant from Andrew there. And I'm sure you'll... Uh, enjoy that. I'm sure you'll come back to the archive and go back over that again. Uh, it's uh, it's a stunning subject, but as I say, with this, I perhaps I put a too long title because I say some people they'll have a problem uh, putting uh, trees in for various reasons. So I talk about the labyrinth garden alternative, and that's a picture sort of of the herb labyrinth we got here. And uh, we got four smaller labyrinths uh, around here um, in the labyrinth gardens here. Um, that's the herb one there. We got uh, the triple spiral. Um, that's that's another one of the herb labyrinths with people. The triple uh, spiral is a work in progress. Actually, Claire's been working a lot on that, and so I should get some update pictures. But this is what happens when that overgrowns. Believe it or not, there's lavender in that and uh, but there's a fire dance garden here uh with flowers and, and there's the soft root serpent there's also another labyrinth garden in progress but these could all be sanctuary gardens but for me if i couldn't connect with a tree labyrinth i'd be in trouble that's the that's the passion uh for me but not everybody as i say has space uh, for trees in their garden Unfortunately, in some areas, the local council forbids it, which is absolutely crazy, but I know that some do. And there's frequent disputes with neighbours, sometimes over trees, which is really disgusting, but a lot of people don't like their neighbours growing trees. They complain about light being reduced, roots creeping into drainage and foundations, or simply they're just people that live to say no. Um, so, but some of you may be in that situation. Uh, so herbs, flowers, small shrubs, labyrinth garden may be what you've got, um, can do, but it's a contemplation seat in the centre. But if you are restricted from trees, and Andrew pointed this out, get together with others of a similar passion, similar interest. Let's get this uh, tree uh, passion going. Uh, you know, it's not about just getting some trees in. Is something that's got to be in your spirit. Let that spirit with that connection be tree people. And um, just talk about it with people around you. You'll 
find people of like mind, like passion, and you'll get together and eventually you'll create a sanctuary woodland somewhere or join a group that's already doing this. Now, I'm not going to say any more about this, but bring this up in comments and enduring. Maybe ask questions in the panel section later. So, um, we've the community project potential. I was going to cover this, but time is running out now, so I'll leave that till next Sunday. But do consider, as I say, people who've got passions for woodlands, talk about it, get together with people. And until we... Um, Meet up again. We can have online watch parties. You can put the call of the forest in with a, a watch party. It's on Vimeo uh, and get together with that. Uh, it's a good option. And from local woodland passion, uh, from a small woodland passion network, you may be able to find a site locally and get going uh, with what started, get people joining uh, with the local projects. And then there is uh, the neighbourhoods in Ireland. I have mixed uh, feelings. First thing you see is the gravel pathway, but people get the strollers in there. They can get the wheelchairs. So there's, uh, the Fo Western Forestry Corp uh, near Sligo, they're wonderful consultants for helping get this going. They've taken over from Sligo Council, thank goodness. And I've called them up. Extremely patient, helpful people. And they're covering a few counties now. And uh, Andrew will have contacts for help as well. Now, I'm going on to another guest. Uh, we've got a couple of very brief guests for your entertainment here. And uh, we've got uh, Bear, and uh, for some reason, someone has dis Bear has disappeared. Oh, oh, uh, right. Where are you, Bear? Yes, I think we've still got Bear. And uh, she's back with us again. She's been planting trees for a week, trying to sang tree. She sent me the video to share this to tell a story last week. So here's Bay, the story, uh, Bayer, the storyteller. This is her um, video of her planting some trees. The one thing that's interesting, last week when we did bare root planting, there was me doing almost like the Gardens World version. I was doing the whole bit with the, uh, the compost and the spreading the uh, roots and putting uh, the leaf mold on the top and and some uh, mulch uh, from twigs here. And uh, it was all, you know, but if you've got two or 300 trees to put in, that's going to send you crazy if it's, you're doing it yourself. So you'll see Bayer doing a quick version. That actually does work as well, but you will have to sort of leave. So I'll, I'll give you Bayer. This is Bayer now. It's Bayer, Sam and Hawk. I am Bayer, the storyteller. And uh, today I'm not telling stories. I'm planting trees. I've got this bundle here. <laughs> of hedge, hedge trees, saplings. There's birch, there's oak, um, and there is hawthorn, and there's ash as well. So I'm going to plant them alongside this fence there. And uh, I'm dedicating those saplings to my friends. I belong, I've got a group of friends in America and Canada, and today I'm planting it for them, and so hoping that one day they will come and uh, visit. Um, those little trees that I'm planting and if you turn the camera around you can have a look at the land that I live on and you will see all the trees I've already planted if you look at the orchards there's the hen's house on the right hand side and then there's the orchard over there and then turning around a bit oh, more okay. you can have a look at the beautiful I live on top of a hill and of course there will be a tractor going by because there usually is. And the way you plant trees, oh, I can't see anything now. saplings is ever so simple. Come closer to me, my lovely cameraman, sorry. woman. I'm Hey, so, what's I'm happening? Just, oh it's alright, yeah. Yes. I'm, we're having I'm having a wonderful camera woman. <laughs> and uh, basically, <laughs> Not I mean so really wonderful. planting hedges is so easy. You just need to dig it slit in the land if you want to come closer to me you can have a look and then hopefully the dog will not be a pain and basically i've left it in water overnight mm -hmm. and i just plonk it down against the fence and there you go that's a bit of ash that is and that's how you plant a tree why don't you have a go it's ever so simple another day like today it's miraculous 
this is me, Bea, the storyteller, signing off because I've got some trees to plant. And maybe my lovely camera woman, can you press on the dot again? And then we'll stop recording. Well, thanks very much, Bea. That's a little video that we didn't play last week. And uh, I got another video. In fact, I hand lined it up. So I'm going to line it up with you uh, very quickly. Uh, this is um, uh, Howard Hawksley. Um, uh, we haven't had a song uh, from Howard for some time now. And he's done a beautiful uh, cover of a beautiful Robert Tannehill song, uh, Gloomy Winter No Way, um, which, uh, now see if I can find it. Uh, which is very appropriate because this is the last of our March wind days today. And uh, we're going into a beautiful week next week and you'll be out in your gardens, I say. So here is Howard. I love this song. Um, it's quite a sing-along in uh, Keeleys in Scotland. And uh, so it's, always, it's very appropriate for these Sunday sessions, uh, especially when we're outside in the tree labyrinth as we were during the past two Sundays. But the weather forecast from Tuesday onwards, fabulous for a while. And so it's written in Scottish, old Scottish here, captures the romantic feeling of spring when a young man's heart flutters. And uh, it's how he shares this with a lovely woodland video uh, by his home where winter's still amongst the trees and is waiting to burst out. So I've got to bring this up in a different way. Let's see if I can get this for you. And uh, I, I think it should come up. There it is.
some reason, I'm off. And uh, I'll bring uh, Andrew back on and uh, we'll get something straight here. I hope you've enjoyed this, especially uh, Andrew and what he presented. Uh, we're not finished yet because it's over to you. Use a few minutes. I know we're on overtime now, but ask some questions about anything that, that uh, has been talked about this afternoon, what uh, Andrew has presented. Uh, and I'll check. You've been leaving a, a few comments there. Let's see what we've uh, got here. You enjoyed, uh, Donna enjoyed the song, and someone's glad that the March winds are just going away. And then Claire Roach says thank you to Bayer. I don't know if she's been watching as well. Uh, and we've got some, uh, Ashley is in uh, late from Wicklow. Lovely to have you here. Uh, Sean Fitzgerald's been saying it's fascinating. But get your questions in that we've had about the forest in a box, Brehan Laws, uh, Association with Trees Connection, uh, your own tree sanctuary. And uh, Davina, uh, thank you for educating us on protecting the forest. And yeah, interesting the plates and cups were made from the wood. <laughs> uh, I wonder how that was. Yeah, so there's a question there. And uh, I'd like to know, Andrew, why were the U bowls not toxic? Um, the, the, well, the wood itself is not, um, the, the wood is not toxic. The, the, the poison, as I say, is in, it's in the bark it's in the leaf and it's in the the seed the you know the seed that's in the berry so the wood itself is the most beautiful hardwood they made furniture from it as i say they made plates the the king's bed the the all of the furniture all, everything connected with um the king was made from you um Again, it, it was the most sacred tree. So in a sense, an Irish king was wedded to the land. The, the ceremony involved the, the, the marriage of a king to the land. The king was a servant of the people. And the king was elected by the Der Finna. The Der Finna was a, like a committee representing four generations within the Tua within the tribe. So they, they had a, you know, as an expression, why, why are the people stronger than a king? Because only the people can elect a king. The king cannot elect the people. So to be, a, you know, king was to be a huge responsibility. It was to ensure the Brehan law was um, in place, was respected. It was to ensure that the land was fertile, that the people were looked after that the you know that was what the the oath a king was sworn in with so it, it wasn't um the king had to be in good health he had to have a, of sound mind he had to have two arms two eyes two ears you know the story john of the king has donkey's ears do you no i don't know that one you i the remind world. me of that well it, again, it's about the connection people had with nature and with trees. And uh, there was a king who he had donkey's ears, and he, he they were hidden. He hid them, he, so he should not have been a, a king under the Brehan law. And he was a, a kind of dictator type king. And every time he had his hair cut, the barber was killed, so he wouldn't tell anybody that the king had donkey's ears. So the Rumors went around the community that this was the case. And the next uh, barber was the son of a widow. And she knew that her son was would be killed. And she pleaded and pleaded uh, to spare his life. So the barber was sworn to never tell, tell anybody that the king had donkey's ears. Now, the son became very ill, became extremely sick. And the druid came, the, the medicinal druid came to administer herbs and to look beyond the physical ailments as they did and were, were trained to do. And he told the mother, he said, this, this boy is dying because he, he's holding a secret. He, he's, so, he's holding something inside him is killing him. And this, again, is a lesson for us about not sharing 
our problems. You know, when we when we go inside, we don't share. We become ill. We become stressed. So the mother said, "Well, what can I do?" He said, "There's no physical medicine. the The boy has to go um, and tell somebody." So the, the the mother said, "He can't tell a person. He, you know, he's sworn under oath." So the druid said, "Tell it to a tree." And the druid told him where to go to a very old willow deep in the forest. So the boy did that and he, he recovered, completely recovered. Years later, the, the de despotic king ordered a new harp to be made. And the, the, the musical instrument maker went and cut that willow tree that was holding the secret. And the first time that harp was played in the royal court, the harp sang out the king has donkey's ears and exposed uh -huh. the uh -huh. dictator. So, you know, again, just in, in terms of um, people who want to connect with nature and with trees in particular, if I may just share, you know, a simple way is to approach a tree and show that you carry no weapon, hold your hands open and approach the tree very slowly in a clock, clockwise motion, if you can, at, uh, the sun, the, the direction of the, the sun, and move slowly into to the center to that tree. Turn around and put your back to the tree and slowly um, let, basically sit, if you, need, if you can, at the base of the tree. But by having your back to the tree, it's the closest your central nervous system is to a tree's central nervous system or life force which is just beneath the between the wood and the bark it's a place of wisdom again under gaelic uh, wisdom triads where you know where the tree places to find wisdom one is between the bark of the tree and the and the wood one is between the mountain top and the sky and the other is between the the earth and water so be it a river, a stream, or the ocean, those three places are where we find wisdom. So by having your back or your, your spine and nervous system connect, then the two life forces can very easily um, basically r relate. Switch your mind off and be with the tree and imagine that you're, you're rooted like the tree. And basically in that way, you can connect into the the whole plant kingdom through the tr through the trees, and you can you know never be alone. So anybody suffering with depression or you know difficulties, go to the trees. Each of them have different properties. Uh, Glenny Kindred, an amazing artist and tree woman, has produced some beautiful little books. Uh, the the um, tree what was a tree wisdom. A great little book if you can get your hands on it and uh, she describes that process of how to connect with with a tree and a very simple thing to do for anybody to do and like i say we are not never alone and also we are connected to in this web of life we are all part no, no, nothing is separate we are everything living is connected and the trees remind us and teach us that so Ah, oh, wonderful. And now you were saying there was a, you had a request to share a poem. What I would do, I'm going to uh, explain what's coming up, and I would love you to be able to finish our show up with that uh, poem that you requested. That, is it We Are Trees? Um, and our, uh, that uh, there are trees, yeah. There are if you trees. can do that, I'm going to just present um, what's coming up, and then we'll get, uh, love to finish with that if you can, Andrew. It'd be fabulous way to close this wonderful well next week uh it's going to be the um birthday of carol Curry sunday sessions online the online version anyway and uh, we go back to where we first began this is next week 21st of march uh it's us and trees what can we do and there is a website which i need to seriously update uh but we're going back to that and it's going to, we're going to have guests for that so that'll be wonderful and then on the 28th of March, floating back into the mythology with the folklore, combining uh, water and wells. Uh, this is going to be the tree in water folklore. 
And uh, Sarah Humble will be back uh, to help us along with that one. Uh, she's been developing some wonderful articles and information, so it'd be great to have her back for then. And then through April and May, it's back into our she folklore again, especially in relation to our new fresh spring and early summer gardening. Um, and when it, uh, Easter, was it 4th of April for Easter? I'll be doing the regeneration and three trees again, uh, the trees being uh, uh, T-R-A-I. So go through the three strains of the bards, how that relates to us, how that relates to our, our relationship with trees and landscapes around us. Uh, and uh, so presenting those three strains as a lifestyle inspired by the folklore. So that's uh, what's coming up. Uh, and uh, so thanks, really. Uh, thanks indeed for Andrew for his generosity today. The video from Bear the Storyteller and the song from Howard Hawksley. Uh, I would like to ask if you're watching the archive, uh, do keep commenting here. Uh, I'll be watching the comments after live. The, uh, a lot of people will be listening this evening and tomorrow, I know. Uh, but keep commenting and we'll keep the conversation going for this edition. Um, subscribe and click to the bell icons both on YouTube and I think Facebook has the bell too to remind you of details of what's coming up the next Sunday sessions. So I'm going to pass you back to Andrew now uh, uh, where he will be sharing a poem. Uh, well, first, let's see if you've asked any more questions here. Um, uh, uh, yes, thanks to Andrew here in search of the miraculous. And Sherry uh, loved having Bayer as well. That was fantastic. Um, and Andrew's talk reminds me of a class I'm taking on plant communications, uh, plant wisdom. Fabulous. Uh, green connection. Uh, Sherry really enjoyed this. So let's pass you to Andrew, who I gather has got. Um, a lovely poem. Uh, there are trees by Alice Milligan. Over to you, uh, Andrew, again. Okay, <clears throat> uh, thank you, and um, thank you for the comments. And um, ju just before I recite the poem, um, I'd just like to remind people again of the work of Diana Beresford Kruger and the fact that she. Her background is med medical science as well as uh, botany, being an ethnobotanist, an ancient woodland specialist. Her original training was in um, blood, and you know blood um, and me medical science. Um, so in her book, *The Global Forest*, she describes the colors of the the red and the green as reminding us that our blood blood cells are identical to chlorophyll cells. The design of a red blood cell is identical to a green plant chlorophyll cell. The difference is in the center, the nucleus of the chlorophyll cell is um, magnesium metal. Inside the red blood cell is iron. They both have four rings of nitrogen surrounding the nucleus and the chlorophyll, the feeds on um, CO2 and it releases its waste product as oxygen. The red blood cell feeds on oxygen and its waste product is carbon dioxide. She describes that tick-tock of life again. It's no accident how deeply connected and related we are to the plant kingdom. And uh, yeah, just to finish, this poem is by Alice Milligan. It's from about 19, early 1900s, when Ireland had less than 1% tree cover on the whole island. And she was part of the, the Gaelic League. It was a movement to revive information and knowledge and respect for the Gaelic culture. Um, and it's called There Are Trees. So fallen in Erin, are all our leafy forests. The oaks lie buried under a bogland mold. Only in legend dim are they remembered. Only in ancient books their fame is told. But seers who dream of times to come have promised 
forests will rise where perished these. And of this desolate land it shall be spoken in Tyrconnell of the territories, there are trees. So she was from Tyrconnell, which is in, in Ulster, uh, Tyrone, the um, county of Tyrone. So that, that's it. And uh, if, you, if you do plant trees, please take care of them. The young trees need care and attention and they need protection. Protection from streamers, from hares, from deer. Um, thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, wonderful. Let's get. Uh, thank you. That's been so wonderful this afternoon. It's been worth going on to overtime. <clears throat> so now I'm losing my voice. And I'm surprised you didn't lose yours. So thanks again, Andrew. I hope we'll see you here again. Uh, and uh, as sharing your passion with the trees. And hopefully this will send the viewers and the later viewers. Because it's amazing how many views there is after we finished. Uh, off onto the passion. So thanks again, and we'll see you again one day. So really, I've covered it all, and, it's, and happy Mother's Day for the rest of you if you're going off with your mothers. Enjoy uh, a very safe week, of course, uh, full of wonder, inspiration, enchantments. So until next Sunday, play well, and it's bye from me. Bye. Bye.